Welcome everybody to the Real Deals Podcast, one of the top ranked real estate investing podcasts for the last seven years. This is the place to be for investing strategies you can actually use, expert interviews, and of course, some good old fashioned entertainment. Now, here's your host for the show, Elliot, the REI guy, Smith. going on real deals podcast listeners sorry i missed the show last week i had somebody lined up and then i just got super busy with everything going on and by the time it was showtime on friday i'm like crap and then just didn't get to a show last week so apologize about that so get a show out this week and it's going to be a solo show and there's a couple of things i really want to talk about because there's a lot going on in the world right now in the markets in the stock market in the real estate market there's a, a lot of inflation talk and a lot of these things coming out so i want to kind of dive into those also just got off a call with a guy one of our clients and he had some questions about his isas and how do you handle different conversations and rebuttals and i want to dive into how to become the authority to the sellers in your market or the people that you're talking to so anyway, what's going on with me this week? So we have, I don't know, I've been getting lucky. I mean, there's sometimes you've been in this game long enough, you tend to get lucky, things just kind of come your way. So I've talked about the deal, the guy just walked into our shop with this the postcard that we sent him and we bought that house like five days later. So we closed on that one. I haven't started working on it yet, but it's uh, gonna be a good filler project. Then I got a call from my stepmom, who's actually a realtor. So she called me in the realtor capacity and she had a client that was buying a house, but needed to show proof of funds for having, well, they needed the money to buy their house because they're going to put 20% down. And so we had a rental that his son was living in and grandson. And so we went and walked that on a Saturday. He said he wanted no more than he wouldn't take anything less than 160. It's probably a 265 house fixed up. And I went and walked it and it was just not in good shape. But, and so I offered him, uh, this is one of those rare times where like I actually could just give an offer, but I knew the guy wanted to move fit fast and it was more of a business transaction because they needed to make a decision on this other house that they were trying to make an offer on. So I came in and said, hey, I'll pay 130. He didn't sound like he liked that at all, but then I just kept going and kind of didn't let him talk. And I said, but I'll buy it with your with its, your son in it, give him a month to move out or whatever, 30 day rent back because they were gonna move his son, their son into the house that they're buying. And I said, I'll close it whenever you want. I can close it in seven days or I can close it in a month, depending on if you don't get this house or not that you're making an offer on. And so super easy, the terms are fantastic. Yeah. 10,000 non-refundable earnest money. He actually had an offer for 155 uh, on the table. And he took my offer at 130. So you have to understand what the points are with these sellers and where their pain points are and what they need. So we signed the contract a couple of days later because they wanted to wait to sign the contract until after they got this house that they were going after and they got it. So signed the contract the same day they signed the contract for their other house. So then they ended up needing to show proof of funds. So we ended up closing it in seven days. I had my lender, I called my lender. So we we're buying at 130, called my lender, said, hey, I got this property, I'll give you 8%, but I need 150,000. And so they said, okay. So they gave me 150. So we got a check at closing for like 18 grand to help us with some of the rehab costs. But it probably needs like 65. We're gonna gut the whole thing probably and change the floor plan and layout. So that was a good one. And then I just got a call uh, last week from another realtor that had a client that needed to sell their house. And this is a crazy story. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. The lady is selling the house because she needs to get money to help her internet boyfriend pay taxes. But then the internet boyfriend is then going to turn around and buy her a condo. Uh, so it doesn't make a ton of sense, but we were very upfront and we're gonna make sure that she signs something that she knows what she's doing. She's definitely a sound mind. It's just, uh, hopefully she doesn't get taken advantage of it, this. But anyway, so we went and walked the property. Uh, she wanted no less than 300 cause she needed to pay off stuff and that's kind of what she needed. It wasn't a bad, like gonna be a huge rehab, but it's a big house. So it's gonna be an ex more expensive rehab. But so we went and tied it up for 275. And so we're pending that and we'll probably close that here shortly. So just some stuff falling in my lap and it's kind of kind of crazy. So 
Also, we underwrote an uh, 80 unit apartment building and found out some crazy stuff. We, when we underwrote it, we're like, this is like a three and a half cap and you put a million to 2 million into it and it comes up to a five, maybe five and a quarter cap. Like, this is a terrible deal. So we're like, we're gonna go back to this broker because it was an off, mark, off market pocket listing, which all multifamily is, nothing gets listed. And we're like, you know, my buddy was talking to him and he, we were gonna say, hey, we need to pay seven, five or eight million. And before he even got there, the guy's like, no, we'll have this sold in a week. That's what the market's paying for things right now is they're buying it at three and a half cap to hopefully push it to a five cap. And that's like a good deal, which is crazy to me. Like just doesn't make sense. And then it, but then the, the flip side of that is it makes the deals that we bought look so much better. The 25 unit and the 32 unit we're under contract with. So it's kind of crazy in my mind. So really, really gets me excited about the Molly family stuff because the 25 unit we closed on in May, we bought it at a seven, eight cap and the appraiser actually, so we bought it for 87, five a door basically. And the appraiser for our 32 unit, we just got the appraisal back this Monday, used that was one of the comps, but he actually in there placed the value of that 25 unit at 125,000 a door. So like 3.1 or something like that. So that just shows like, and that's with, you know, nothing really than just, we got a good deal. And I knew when we bought it that we probably bought it 700,000 of equity. Now we're looking at like a million of equity already in that thing. And that's really the cool thing about multifamily. And so, and then this unit that we're buying, we're the 32 unit, we're buying it for 110 a door, but we're going to put some rehab in there and we think we can push it up to, you know, 135, 140 a door. So we think we, we're buying it around a five cap. We think we can push it to eight and a half to a nine cap. So will be a good deal judging by what the market's trading for right now uh, with that broker, you know, we're buying good deals. So really focusing on getting some more. I had a good conversation yesterday with somebody that had a, you know, a 30 plus unit in Vancouver, weren't ready to sell, but really going after the multifamily hard. So if you are in the Northwest, we are looking to buy more multifamily. I do need 1031. So we're looking to buy a two to $20 million multifamily deal. So probably more like a three to 20 million is really what we're looking at. So pretty exciting. I still don't know the hell I'm doing, but we're kind of just figuring out as we go along and just trying to underwrite as many deals as possible. So that's kind of what's going on with me. Call Magic is growing like a weed. We're actually buying now in three markets with our call center um, ourself. We're in three markets, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas. We just launched San Antonio and Dallas last week. We've already tied up like six deals. We've closed one in Houston, and that's like in the first three weeks or whatever, four weeks that we've been doing this. So pretty exciting because that's getting all closed from our East uh, Egypt call center. So definitely uh, excited about that. Really quick, we are getting all our data from Easy uh EasySkipTrace.com. We built the site out. You should go check it out. The data is fantastic. Everybody talks about having higher hit rates. Hit rates don't mean shit if they're not the right phone numbers. We have tested this and tested this with data scientists. Our hit rate is good. We're like a 91% hit rate, but our phone numbers are just as good as the credit bureau data. We've tested this against credit bureau, like regulated illegal data you can't get for cold calling for real estate. You can only get it if you're credit or have a debt collector license, but literally our data is 92% as accurate as that. If you're looking at IDI and things like that, or any of these other companies, we've tested all of them. Literally they're at like 45% as accurate as credit bureau data. So better data. It's what we've been using in the call center. We finally got a front facing site out there, but it's easy skiptrace.com. So easy skiptrace.com. Go check it out. But the pricing's great. It's easy, easy to use. Um, if you're trying to do cold calling or anything or texting, it's just going to get you more connections and it's, you're going to pay basically the same price, if not a little bit less than everybody else. And it's easy to upload your list on there. So uh, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and 
want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best hands down in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state. And if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, guys. So I want to talk a little bit about what is going on in the market right now. Not just the real estate market, but just the markets in general. So there's a lot of headlines right now. For the last six to nine months, They've been saying inflation's here, but it's transitory. That's been the main word. Inflation is transitory, 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 which basically means that it's it's here, but it's not here to stay. They're like, it will run its course. Well, that has not proven to be the case. And I've been saying, I've been saying since the pandemic, that's why we started moving really quickly into multifamily last year, that inflation and asset appreciation is going to be a real thing. And so I not smarter than anybody else. It just seemed to make sense to me, but I've been talking about that for a while. So uh, I wish I would have bought more. That's the biggest problem. I should have bought more flips. I didn't see that happening as much on the flip side. So anyway, but inflation is real right now. They have printed a ton of money and everybody knows that it's an easy talking point, but what is actually really important a conversation is there's a thing called the velocity of money. And so when you're looking at the velocity of money, I'm going to pull up the definition here, velocity of money. So I'm that so the velocity of money is basically is how much velocity of money is a measure of the number of times that the average unit of currency is used to purchase goods and services within a given time period period. The concept relates to the size of economic activity to given money supply and the speed of money exchange is one of the variables that determine inflation. So the velocity of money is important. So that basically means does this dollar change hands three times in a time period or four times um, in the same time period? So the faster it goes, the, the more inflation, I believe. So So this is, um, so I'm looking at economic research. So the velocity of money in, let's say, Q4 of 2015 was 1.494, okay? The velocity of money now in Q1 2021 is 1.12. So that means that it's, that's how many times it's, spent and use to purchase domestic produced goods and services within a given time period. And so what is causing the velocity of money to change is it's not moving as quick, right? So the money is got out in, you know, the Fed printed, printed a ton of money, got a ton of money out in the money supply, but it's not moving as fast. This goes back to if you've looked into and read anything on the Fed repo rates and the reverse repo. And so the banks usually, the bank's idea and goal is to lend money, right? That's, that's their job. That's how they make profit usually is they lend money. Now there's other banks that, you know, invest and, you know, do different things, but for the most part, their job and their, their goal is to lend money out. So they need to get money out in the economy so people can go spend it. They can invest in their business business. And that's how the economy grows. Um, let me see. I'm going to see how much money is up there. Reverse repo, repo market gets. Okay, so if we're looking at now before the this market crash, they had what was it called a Fed overnight repo. So the overnight repo rates. 
So what would happen is a bank has to have so much money on their books to cover their loans or cover their bills or whatever. There's the regulations of how much money they have to have. So before the pandemic, the, the Fed would actually lend money to banks and there would be an overnight reverse repo rate. It was short term money, but they might need money for a day or something like that just to hit something. And then and you're talking in billions of dollars here, right? This is a, there are a lot of money. It's not a simple loan, like a go get a dollar, you know, $10,000 from a payday lender or whatever. This is billions of dollars and they only need it for a short period of time. And so what would happen is the Fed, um, the banks would hold, tre would have treasury bonds, which is, you know, a tradable asset. And so they would give the Fed treasury bonds and then the Fed would give them money and they would loan them money. But that was their collateral basically was treasury bonds and there'd be rates for those, right? And again, you're not talking very high rates. You're usually talking 50 to 100 basis points, nothing crazy, but, and not even probably that much. But if you're looking at billions of dollars, like that's a big deal, like, it's a lot of money. What started shifting when the government started putting money and putting all this money out is the banks started having too much cash. Cash became liability. So too much cash in the bank's books is a liability at this point right? Because it's not making them any money. It's actually losing them money to inflation. So, and if they can't lend it out, which they don't want to lend out as much money because the rates are so low to lend it out. So they don't make that much money. So they're being very conservative of what they're lending. And they had so much of it. They just couldn't place it all, right? So then what ended up happening is they started doing the re overnight repo in reverse. So now the banks were sitting on this liability with so much cash, that they ended up, instead of needing cash, they ended up not needing the cash. So they would go do reverse and put it back on the Fed, send it to the Fed, and the Fed would then give them treasury bonds and treasury yields are really low, but they would not make very much money, but they it was a, more of a liability to hold overnight than if they could make 10 basis points <clears throat> or something from the Fed. So now it's going back in the Fed because there's all this money just sitting in the money supply that's not getting moved. So looking at it, as of Tuesday, the 25th, uh, or the 26th, sorry, there is $1.423 trillion that is in the overnight reverse repo going back to the Fed that is not getting placed into our, into our economic system. Now, just for reference, in 2020, January of 2020, there was $3 billion. So that is a lot of money going back overnight into the treasury because they can't place it, right? So your velocity of money is down, right? So money is not moving to everyday people. It's not moving throughout the economy, which is also then driving inflation because yeah, there's a lot of money out there, but it's not moving to everyday people. And so they're sitting on this cash. And so things, goods and services are getting more expensive. Then you also have the supply chain issue with all the boats sitting off of the coast of California. There, there's 60, 80 boats sitting out there that can't get unloaded because of trucker shortages or truckers not wanting to go there because of vaccines. Again, don't care on your opinion on either way. It's not a, you know, a political thought. It's more so a thought of just, it is what it is. And so now you have all these goods and services that can't get bought. You have all this money sitting on the bank, not going to people to buy those because goods and services aren't flowing. And now since they're sitting out there on the coast so long, you are then having the cost to transport these goods skyrocketing. So before the pandemic, it cost $3,000 per container. So if you ever see these big container ships, there's thousands upon thousands of the containers cost $3,000 per container to ship things from overseas or anywhere in the world, mainly from China, right? Now it's costing like $20,000. So right there, the cost has basically gone up by seven times just in that part of the supply chain. Okay. That's the front end of the supply chain. Now you have, you're not getting goods and services. You're not getting raw materials. You're not getting all these things, which then people are waiting and then they're not getting any money. So you can see where this story goes. So it's very interesting. Um, and I love studying this stuff. And if, if you're a real estate investor or anything or just getting started, 
understanding the way money moves and the way the markets move is something that you should be paying attention to because you have to understand your craft, right? And your craft is basically we're a marketing company that, that moves money, right? That's really what we are. We're marketing. Yes. Our asset that we're buying is houses or we're buying, you know, we're doing rentals and things, but our job is capital placement, right? And we're moving money and then we're marketing, but we're marketing for deals, but we're also marketing for lenders, right? So everybody's sitting on this cash, right? The banks are sitting on all this cash. They have $1.5 trillion sitting on their, on their books. So everybody's sitting on a bunch of cash. So nobody knows how to place cash right now. So, you know, it's really easy to get lenders right now to place cash if you can convince them that it's a safe, secure investment. And because everybody's trying to get it out because the money that's sitting in the Fed in the reverse repo or in the banks is deposits. Mostly it's not just the, the bank's money. It's it's you and me money, right? It's our money. But people don't know where to put the money because there's no goods and services to buy. They're saving their cash. You know, more people have more savings now than ever before. Um, and so it's a very interesting concept. So that's why, and so then you're having, then on the other side, you know, everybody's like housing market is the most expensive it's ever been. The, all these different things that people are saying about housing, they're like, it's going to crash. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. But there's some issues here because if we look at, you know, look at the market in general, we have a supply issue and we have a migration issue, right? The pandemic has really changed what the, where the people are living, what they want to live in, you know, it's really shaken up the system. So you have this huge, huge migration pattern that people are moving out of, you know, let's say California, New York, or these, you know, colder states, you know, Washington, you know, maybe they're moving and they're moving more to the Sun Belt, which makes sense, but it doesn't make sense because everybody's like, the weather's better. Yeah, but it's still 120 degrees in the summer in Arizona. Like I wouldn't want to live in 120 degrees. And I also want to don't want to go live in humidity. The best place to probably live if you want good weather is probably San Diego. But then you have all the other issues, right? Taxes, not as good streets, schools, whatever, right? And the taxes are super high. So so that's what you they call it, the um, sunshine tax or whatever. So, but people are moving. And so it's really interesting to to look at those things. So, but so people say, okay, houses are the most expensive they've ever been. All, all this stuff, blah, 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 right? Well, technically they're not. They're actually the more, most in, the, let's say a long period of time, they're actually the most affordable they've ever been because of what? Interest rates, right? Interest rates are historic lows. Yes, they've been going up a little bit, but they're still historically low. And so the cost of that house is quite a bit less because you're looking at it from a monthly payment uh, standpoint. So if I'm trying to find, I saw a guy post the other day about how much you can get in your, let me see, mortgage rate, let's see. Okay, so if you looked at year 2018 and the median sales price for homes was $261,600. But mortgage rates were 4.72%. This is an 18 when interest rates were kind of peaking out. Your monthly payment would be $1,088. So payment percentage of income was on median income was 17%. Now, in 2021, the housing price has jumped up almost $100,000. This is quarter two to 300, the median uh, existing family home is gone, gone up to 357,900 with a mortgage rate of 3.05%. Now your monthly payment with PI payments and interest is $1,215. And you say that's more, that's you know a little bit over hundred dollars more a monthly payment. Yes, however, your percentage uh, payment of income is actually down from 17.1 to 16.5% because median family income has gone up from 76,000 to 88,000. Wages are going up, which again, if we go back to our inflation, if wages are going up, that means prices are going up, right? Because companies have to pay more, which then if they have to pay their employees more means prices of the goods and services they sell are going to cost more money. So it's actually going to be cheaper or more affordable now than it was in 2018 
as a percentage of income, based on income. Now, again, not everybody is, you know, in a, a position to, you know, grow in this economy. I know there's people that are really struggling, but this is a median, you know, thing across the board. So more people are actually doing better now than they were before and they're making more money. You know, there was a big push a couple of years ago for well, even this year, raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Well, I don't think there's any jobs really in most markets that are less than $15 an hour um, in most major markets, right? So, cause they just can't find workers. And so when they can't find workers, they have to pay more money to get workers. And so that's the thought. And so we have a supply issue that's driving housing prices up, but we also our affordability. The reason housing prices can continue to get driven up is because they're technically more affordable still now than they were in 2018. So that is very, very important to look at. So I, I think the, the key takeaway that I have is I want to buy real estate that is cash flowing real estate, right? There's going to be blimps in the market. There's going to be ups and there's downs, just like in 18 when interest rates went way high, the, the market went up, you know, the prices went down in the market at that point. Um, but there's going to be blimps. So like, unless I'm doing short-term flips that I'm in and out really quick, I can gauge the market pretty quickly. That's kind of what I want to be doing. We're building some stuff as well for some multifamily stuff, but like, I don't want to be building houses myself personally, but I want to maybe do some lot development, do some land development and sell this to help with inventory. I think if you're in the entry level to middle market, you're pretty safe in my opinion. But what I really want to own is I want to go own cash flowing real estate. And it doesn't have to be great cash flowing real estate, but just cash flowing real estate in general that I am buying the asset for below replacement cost. So looking at replacement costs, so if I can buy, so in my market, we're probably to go hire a general contractor to go build a house or build or build an apartment building. You're probably looking at uh, roughly 175 to 180 dollars a square foot. Let's say that's if I'm buying paying a general contractor. If I can buy that property for 120 a square foot, that's a older property, and I can spend another. $30 a square foot to renovate it and make it really nice and extend the life. Well, if I'm at $180 a square foot to have somebody build it and I'm all in at $150 a square foot, I still have really good margin there. Because if you look at from inflation, that's why I talked about the inflation in the supply chain, the price of building is not going to go down that much because yes, lumber's jumped up. Now it's gone back down, but there's so many other factors that go into that, right? Your permit costs are going to go up because the city's got to pay more, pay people more, right? They need more money to put more good services out to the community. Your land cost is going up. Your uh, microwaves are going up. Your dishwashers are going up. Your flooring's going up. If you can get it, all these things are going to go up in price. Lumber's not the only thing. Electricians wages are going to go up. All these guys, and then, then all the wages are going to go up to build these houses because they can't get workers, right? And there's a shortage of workers in the construction industry. So, what I really like to look at as a metric, you know, and I told this to my buddy when we were buying the 25 unit, he's like, I don't know if I want to, he didn't want to get in. We offered uh, another guy to get in as a third partner. And he said, no, thank God. He said, no, right. You know, I, it would have been fine to have him in there, but we didn't need him. It was to build a relationship, but I'm very glad he said no. Cause now I own it 50, 50. So I get an extra 17% upside. So, but when I was talking to him, I, I said, what do you think it would cost to build this 25 unit? And at the time, maybe two, five or whatever, it was what we thought, two, five to two, eight, whatever it is, just to rebuild it. We were buying it for two, one. And I'm like, we're well below replacement costs. I think it's a good deal. Now, what we know now is it's a really good deal. And this is when we first tied it up. We weren't really sure. And so, so now I look like a genius. So that is one thing that I would really look at when you're looking at rentals or assets to buy and hold or own. If, if you can't replace it, the odds of the, the, the cost to replace these properties is going to be a lot, lot more in the future. It's just going to happen until they figure this out, the supply chain, it's going to, it's just going to not get figured. It, 
until they figure out the supply chain, it's not gonna get cheaper to build stuff. It's not gonna get cheaper to pay stuff. And then once it goes up, it's probably not gonna come back down. Yeah, inflation might come back down to their 2% level inflation, but it's not gonna go negative. So if we're seeing five to 6% inflation, it's not gonna go negative 6% to bring it back down. It's just, unless we have a huge recession, which I don't see that coming. And even if it did, we had a huge recession last year, briefly. Um, still had issues because it look at all the things it costs. So there's also a ton of money out there chasing yield. There's there's a lot of articles talking about hedge funds buying, you know, now they're saying one six to 25% of the purchases in, are actually going to uh, institutional investors right now. That's a real thing. Um, I seen it firsthand. But then Zillow stopped buying houses. So the question is, why is Zillow stop buying houses? Well, they suck at buying houses, they've overpaid for everything. And they found out that it's really hard to scale the fix up of properties. That's probably more of the issue. So they have way too many houses on their books and they don't have enough contractors or people to actually fix these properties. So they have to pause that. They need to work through their backlog. They'll be back, they'll start buying again. They're not seeing anything else different because I've talked to a lot of these guys that run hedge funds that are way smarter than us. They're buying full, full force. There's more and more money coming to this every single day. So couple opportunities in my opinion, if you're new getting started, if you're in like a middle America market, let's say you're in Phoenix, uh, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma City, things like that. Your opportunity, if you wanna go wholesale, is go find a hedge fund or go find somebody who's paying the most and just go source inventory for them. That's what I would probably do. And that's what we are actually doing right now in three markets, right? That's what we talked about earlier in the intro. So that's one thing I would do. Then I would start going looking at cash flowing real estate and try to buy as much as you possibly can. Live well below your means right now. We still have only live in a house that's $1,200 mortgage. I have no car payments. Most, most of our money goes back into real estate. I do spend some money on some stuff and my health and wellness and things like that. But for the most part, it all goes back into real estate or hiring employees. We're hiring employees. So invest in, if you're just starting out, find an inventory for these big buyers. If you have some capital, buying cash flowing assets. If you are starting to get more capital, go invest in your team and in yourself to go build that business faster. We, let's say we have 18 months of runway in these markets. Let's push as hard as we can right now. That's our goal. Push as hard as we freaking can right this minute. We should have pushed harder last year, but now we're pushing it really, really hard right now. Be careful though in high end price point markets. Now there's a lot of people with a lot of freaking cash. So if you're in the high, high end, I think you're pretty insulated on the high, high end, but in that like higher end, like really nice stuff in the market that's people are still probably getting loans for, that's gonna be a little bit tougher unless you're in like a Kirkland, Washington where there's all this Google and tech and all that stuff. So you gotta pay attention to those um, macro factors, micro, macro. I don't remember the difference, but the local factors, you need to pay attention to that. Also pay attention to the jobs, pay attention to who's coming in. Amazon just announced here that they're putting 2 million square feet of two 1 million square foot buildings in Tri-Cities and Pasco. Warehouses, that's gonna be a big deal. So Amazon following Amazon is a is great thing. So there's a lot of opportunities. If you're sitting back and just saying, man, shit is expensive and I don't think I, I I'm gonna wait to get in. Well, you're gonna be waiting for a while, I believe. So the time to jump in is now. The time to jump in was yesterday, but today you can start as well. So it's the same thing that I screwed up on stocks, right? I don't know enough about stocks. And so every time I look at the stock market, I say, it's too high. It shouldn't be this high. Tesla's too high, all these things. What I'm realizing is I just don't know enough about the stock markets and the way the money moves in and out of these assets. So, you know, yes, from a basic elementary understanding that I have, it looks too high. It should be dropping, right? Inflation's really high. Think, you know, companies aren't really making as much money, blah, 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 all this stuff. But the, the problem is there's a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. So where else are people going to put it? They don't know how to, they don't know how to source real estate deals. They don't know how to add all these things. So they're just going to throw it in the stock market. So more and more capital is chasing yield right now. So that's why the stock market is probably going up still. Or, and then Tesla went up 12 and percent the other day. So crazy world we live in. But the one thing I know is if you can go source deals, which is show is built around, 
you have a skill that most people don't have. We've talked to a lot of these hedge funds, a lot of these startups. They don't know how to buy houses. They're not good at it. Their whole idea on how to buy more houses is just pay more. Literally, in some of these markets, they're paying 112% of retail and buying these single family houses at three and a half cap. It's ridiculous. So if you know how to get real estate at a, you know, 60, 70 cents on the dollar, you should be printing money right now. So go build out your team, go do those things and invest in yourself. Now, I want to talk about something that I think is very important. And I talked about it with the guy that I was just on a call with being the authority. So there's two ways, two things that I think are very important to be the authority in. You need to be the authority for your lenders. So they trust you and you need to be the authority to your sellers, right? So this is, In order to be the authority, you have to educate yourself. You have to understand. You have to have time in the chair and you have to be able to understand what's going on. So to be the authority to my lenders, I don't go out and ask lenders what they want to pay me. I just tell them what I'm going to pay for this deal because I know that they have to get their cash. Now that I pay 8%, sometimes 6% somewhere in there, but in my previous statement that I made early in the show about my the house we bought for 130 and I just told my lender, hey, I need 150,000, here's the address. I don't send them pictures. I don't send them my, my P&L, my, my numbers of what I think it's gonna look like, my rehab numbers or anything like that. I just tell them I'm buying this house and I need this much money. And they sign, send over a deed of trust or I send over a deed of trust, they sign it, they wire in the money, no questions asked because they trust me. I'm the authority because I, I have built that rapport with them. So. Stop asking people for what they want and stop start telling them what you are willing to give them. Now, you got to do that in a respectful way. But again, you are the authority. You're the guy that can go find undervalued real estate and put their money to work and go make more money, which, as we talked about on the reverse repo, there's one point five trillion dollars of cash sitting on these this overnight market that can't find a home. So my goal is, well, I need to go find that those dollars that can't find a home and I'm going to go find a home for them, right? So, cause they need to make more dollars, right? Cause everybody that has money sitting in the bank account right now is losing to inflation. So you're the authority with your lenders. Now with the sellers, you need to be the authority with them. I have always had this mentality, not always, I learned it over time is, and when you're brand new, it's really hard to have this mentality. You get a lead and you're in there and you're trying to make this lead work and you're going to pay more because you really want to get the deal or whatever. Right. But Basically, I am trying to ask the seller from the very beginning whether they fit in my box and that's all I care about. And I want them to know that I'm searching for my, them to fit in my box. So when a seller calls in, uh, let's say off a of direct mail, I have the same line. Hey, Mr. Seller, thanks for calling. You know, I get the address of the property. Great. Can I tell you a little bit about how we work and you can kind of tell me how you'd like to proceed? Does that sound fair, right? So I'm going to give them a choice right there. They say, great, yes, thank you. And I don't care what they say leading up to this, like this is the way the conversation goes. And so the conversation starts there. And so I say, all right, Mr. Seller, if your house has been updated to 2020 standards, 2021 standards, new roof, new bathroom, new kitchen, window siding, things like that, then your best bet is going to be the retail market. This is where you're gonna get the most amount of money. But if your house needs some work, like it could stand to have a roof put on, it could have the windows updated, the flooring could be replaced, uh, it needs to be painted, the kitchens and bathrooms could stand to be updated, then we're a good fit because we have in-house contractors that can get the work done quite a bit cheaper. So right now I'm giving them two options, right? Option one, list with a realtor. Option two, sell it to somebody that needs to, that will fix it up and then sell it. So then I wait and they tell me what bucket they fit in. If they tell me bucket one, the realtor bucket, then I say, great, do you know a realtor? Can I give you a referral? Most of the time they say they know a realtor. Awesome, have a great day, no problem. I'm not a good fit for you, okay? But if they tell me bucket two, then they are giving me permission and I have now become the authority, right? Now all of a sudden they have told me that I fit in in the, they fit in the box that I, I work within right? So they are saying, okay, you're the professional in this area and my house meets this area. And this sounds like what I want. So now I have the authority. So then you can go in there and start asking these questions and talk to them. But again, you're the authority. And where this is really important is when it comes time to negotiate the price, you are the authority. They're looking at you and saying, I have given you the authority. So I'm going to trust what you say. And you've built rapport throughout that. So then when I go to the point of I'm making the offer, I can say, 
look, Mr. Seller, and I'll do the example um, that I used on this other house. Mr. Seller, look, I think your house is worth 430. Does that sound fair? And they say, yeah, I think that's about right. Fixed up. That's why I say fixed up. If I'm going to fix this up, it's probably worth about 430. Okay. I try to always be a little bit conservative on that number, knowing that maybe I can push this to 450, but I want to be conservative. Let's go with a number that we know we can sell it today and get the seller to agree to that and make sure I have some buffer room in there. Right. I don't want to tell the seller my shoot for the moon price because it doesn't make sense. So then I say, okay, Mr. Seller, it cost me seven and a half percent to sell this property. So I then times the 430 times 0.925, uh, seven and a half percent. So right off the top, I have 32,250 in closing costs, right? We have excise tax in Washington, all this stuff. I pay a realtor. So, and then I also buffer in there for if like somebody's gonna want some closing costs when I sell it. So now I'm down to 397,750. Then I'm gonna say, okay, Mr. Seller, how much work do you think this needs? And they'll say, I don't know, or 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, it's probably gonna cost me like 60 to 80,000 to fix this. But let's just go in the middle. You know, I wanna be fair to you knowing in my head that it's probably going to be right around that number or a little bit less. So, so let's say 70. So I'm down to 70, right? All right. So now I have 70,000. So now I'm down to 327, uh, 327, 750. So then Mr. Seller, I got to make money. I mean, I got to pay my crews. I got to pay my, my, or my team. I got to pay, you know, taxes. The government takes all this money. So on this house, I need to make at least 40,000. Like I don't do a percentage, but I just need to make 40,000, right? That's, you know, and I don't get all 40 of that, Mr. Seller. I, you know, that I have to pay holding costs. I got to pay taxes, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? You agree that I should make money? Yeah, they agree that I should make money. Okay. So now I'm down at 287, 750, right? And then I just say, you know, then I got some other auxiliary costs, but so really I have to be in the 260 to 275 range, right? Knowing that they're going to probably be on that 275 top. So that's how I do it. And, and it works. 90% of the time I get the deals. It's just because I am the authority. So they trust me and I show them the math right in front of me. So it's very, very simple at the end of the day. But in order to be the authority in your market to your lenders or to the sellers, you have to have time in the chair, you have to learn. And so if you don't have a ton of time in the chair, what do you need to do? Well, you need to study, you need to read books, you need to go work with other flippers, you need to go mentor or, or not mentor, you need to go shadow guys, you know, Go say, hey, can I go run materials for you? Can I do this just because I want to learn from you? All these different things. And so that's how you get to become the authority really fast. So studying um, and going and seeking mentors or paying coaches or whatever it is, those are the things that you should be doing to become the authority. And once you get that mindset, I guarantee the amount of money you pay to private lenders or lenders in general is going to go down a ton. The amount of houses you're going to buy is going to go up, right? It's going to give you more confidence, but there's a, you have to build that confidence. So anyway, hopefully you guys understood a lot of this stuff. If you have any questions, please reach out to me on Instagram, Elliot Smith, REI, or reach out you know, on the show. But I think you're really going to, um, if you do these things and study these markets and you put this stuff in place, you're going to become the authority in your market and it's going to be very, very good for you in the long term. But get after it today. Start learning. Start spending time. If you really want this, you will make it work. I've seen so many people that that aren't the sharpest tool. I'm not the sharpest tool. and But the one thing they all have in common, and myself included, is we just don't quit right? We just want it that bad. So unless you want this so bad, it's going to be really easy to quit. It's like saying you really want to go to the gym, but you never show up at the gym. Well, when I started getting fat, I realized my wife was making fun of me for getting fat. <clears throat> I decided that I really need to go to the gym and I've been going for 18 months now in a row. So five days a week. I mean, I've missed some stuff here and there, but like I needed to lose weight and I had some reason why I needed to go lose that weight and go to the gym. So I found a way to make that happen, right? If you want to change where you're at, you need to make sure that you're all in. And sometimes it's just not bad enough for you to want to change. So anyway, hopefully this guy, this helps you guys and girls, and I will catch you on the next one.